and start our webinar sessions today. Okay. Prof Dato, are you here? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think we can start, yeah? Okay. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of committee, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. We appreciate you taking your time uh, from your busy schedule to join us today. We hope you will learn a lot today. We have lined up for you to be fruitful and engaging. So before this webinar begins, I request all of cooperation from all of you. Just a few seconds to recite Surah Al-Fatiha together. Um, okay. Uh, we are having a session from Selangor, Malaysia, which is this uh, will present and discuss on Sharia in architecture, focus building, planning and design. Uh, for your information, this is the third webinar series collaboration that organized by Sharia in Built Environment, CBA, from Southeast Asia Built Environment Research Center, CBAC, Faculty of Architecture, Planning and UIT collaboration with Muhammad in Islamic built environment will be uh, from Academic of Contemporary Islamic Studies at UITM. So, furthermore, I would like to welcome if we have here um, our, both uh, FSQ and HS Dean and together with the Putu Deans. So for our webinar today, the floor will start with uh, speakers sharing presentations and it will end up with the open questions and answer sessions. Therefore, any question from participants, please write it in a chat box or you may ask uh, directly to the speaker. Beside, the committee will share the link for feedback attendance form. The cooperation for all participants is greatly appreciated. So I think this is the time that we have to start to introduce our speaker. So what we have here is uh, Professor Datuk Seri A.R. Dr. Asia Abdurrahim is a professor at the Department of Architecture in Korea of uh, Architecture and Environmental Design, KAID, in the National Islamic University of Malaysia, IIUM, a park uh, being a professional architect, managing her own architecture firm, Tessa Architect. She is also her own architect for designing for persons with disability, UWDs, universal design expert, and an access audit consultant. She obtained her PhD from Oxford Brooks University, United Kingdom, with her previous degree of Bachelor of Architecture from Beacon University in Australia, Diploma in Architecture from our local University of Technology, the UTM. She was a council member, Malaysia Institute of Architect Fam, from 1994 until 2004, uh, with an honorable treasurer. Uh, she has been representing the institute to attend a meeting regarding accessibility disability and habitat agenda at the United Nations in New York, USA and Bangkok, Thailand. She is also an active member of LAM, known as Malaysia Board of Architects for three years and contribute in developing continuing uh, professional development CPD program. Besides, uh, she was among the pioneer lecturer in establishing um, Kulia of Architecture and Environmental Design, Kait of International Islamic University Malaysia about 20 years ago. Many of her works have been published, for example, um, first is the Assess Audit in Religious Building and Public Spaces in Damascus City, Syria, Housing in Islamic Perspective, Brunei as a Case Study, 
keperluan pengguna dan reka bentuk bangunan untuk orang di Malaysia, IBS towards open building system in Malaysia and chairing seven Malaysian standard including MS 1184 to uh, 2014. She is the chief editor of Journal of uh, Universal Design in Built Environment and also Journals of Architecture Planning and Construction Management, a ongoing active researcher and consultant for the design of uh, design of person with disability, design for aging populations, elderly, and also responsive design for people perspective and people needs requirement. She has received recognition by achieving the IIUM Quality Research Award in 2003 and 2013. So basically, um, she has an invite uh, researcher and has a public widely in both local and international journal in the additional need. She is an immediate speaker and has spoken in many conferences in Malaysia and abroad. So, all right, without um, any further ado, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Professor Datuk Seri A.R. Dr. Asia Abdul Rahim. The floor is yours, Dr. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank the, the moderator today, uh, Miss Nor Hazira Hasni, uh, for your introduction. I also would like to thank Professor Dr. Surveyor, uh, Dr. Khairuddin Abdul Rashid, who has uh, invited me to present a paper today. Um, I would like to share uh, my knowledge. Uh, I have been in UIA for the past 22 years. Um, being a professional architect uh, and also researcher, my knowledge uh, related to Islamic uh, review knowledge, um, not that much, but I'm trying to share with you. But uh, one thing I would like to, to inform you that I learned a lot uh, being a, a lecturer in UIA, uh, especially uh, on this area, uh, Islamic built environment. So before that, I would like to share with you one of the study that I did with my student in July, uh, in September on heritage study. One of the key study is Masjid Jame. Uh, it is about three minutes uh, film, uh, video. Mm -hmm. Agama Islam amat sebenar Peraturannya cukup benar Tetaplah pada Jangan nanar Peroleh kebajikan yang bersinar So this is the heart of care. This is where everything began. These buildings are the buildings that form the core of Kuala Lumpur. The Sultan wanted this mosque to be built. The mosque, in this case, um, is a tourist attraction.
uh, this is the trailer by uh, my group Sutra. Uh, for our heritage study, uh, we did our uh, masjid drawing in Masjid Jamek. Masjid Jamek is very, very important to Malaysia. Uh, this building is iconic and this is the first uh, masjid yeah, uh, uh, at the national level, which is which is located in Kuala Lumpur. And in 1960s, uh, Masjid Negara was uh, constructed and Masjid Negara now become the uh, national masjid for Malaysia. So that is a little bit uh, of the roh eh, of uh, Islam, which is a uh, masjid, uh, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when I was given this topic by Professor uh, Dr. Khairuddin Abdul Rajid, I was a little bit nervous. Uh, I was a little bit uh, worried as well because uh, the topic is quite big, but uh, based on my 22 years experience uh, teaching in UIA, but before that I was a practicing architect uh, with my small firm and, and uh, but uh, you know, with that uh, experience that I would like to share with you, how I uh, uh, integrate Islamic uh, teaching into my profession as, a, as an architect as well as a lecturer uh, to, uh, to, uh, to share this, this knowledge uh, or to impart this knowledge to the students. Um, but uh, before that, I would like to thank uh, UITM again because I was uh, sponsored by UITM to do my PhD in 1989 until 1994. And I was a UITM lecturer before, before I joined uh, UIUM. I stopped uh, UITM because I opened my firm, uh, Dasa Architect. Later on, I joined IIUM. Okay, um, before I proceed, I would like to give you a little bit uh, background of uh, the historical timeline of the built environment, just to get us some ideas, okay? So Nabi Adam, Alayhi Salam, is our first prophet. So uh, all of us, uh, his, uh, uh, all of us are his uh, grand grand son or granddaughters. By and how were his wife? Yeah? So Islam started during his time, until now. Yeah? So we know about the Mesopotamia, and then Egyptian, uh, the pyramid, yeah? and and so on. There are a lot of all, all sort of architecture, and. Islam uh, became materialized uh, when Masjid Kuba uh, in Madinah, eh? it was the first masjid uh, by a prophet, uh, and then, and then, uh, and then Islam was spread all over the world. So you see Islamic architecture in different form. Let's say if it is in Morocco, we call it uh, Moorish architecture. If it is Spain, uh, for example, uh, Alhambra, yeah? in Alhambra, you, in Granada, you see different type of architecture, and later in uh, include in uh, Egypt as well and uh, Abbasid, Syria and Iraq. I have been to many of these places, so I can share a little bit of my experience. And because I learned through visiting the, these places, yeah? and then we learned about Ottoman in Turkey, yeah? because Islam spread during Ottoman more than thirty-two countries in the world. Architecture, heritage, culture, food, uh, architecture form, and so on, and then uh, spread to India and the Mughal architecture. I've been to all uh, New Delhi. I've visited uh, Taj Mahal with Professor Dr. Ismawi. Yeah, so all this architecture, I can see uh, how uh, Islamic civilization play an important role. Mm. One thing for sure, I remember uh, my very good friend, Professor Dr. Ismawi. I think he was the best ever uh, technical person uh, uh, who have uh, who has contributed a lot uh, uh, in this topic. So I'm I'm one of his uh, student, um, uh, sharing uh, his thought and so on. And I learned through uh, together with him. And at the same time, when I I work in UIA. Uh, I read Quran and learn about uh, Sunnah as well. And I read Quran almost every day uh, to understand further because I cannot talk to you about this topic if if Ruh Islam too, uh, is not with me. 
So the spirit of Islam is very important for us to understand yeah, uh, what is Islam and also the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we have to follow through whatever our Prophet uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa uh, mentioned to us whether verbally or um, his action. So those are uh, some of the uh, information which I uh, would like to share with you. And also in our country, uh, Islam arrived yeah, uh, from Terengganu, eh, dalam kurun ke-7 ke-8 macam tu. And it was written by Ibn Batuta. And then Islam was spread from the south of, uh, from south of Thailand, south of, uh, in, in Nusantara. Yeah? And then we also got uh, Islam from uh, uh, south of uh, Filipina, uh, Sumatra, and, uh, and, and also Kalimantan. So these are all uh, kawasan, uh, apa ni, uh, Tanah Melayu, eh? the Malay uh, area, eh? and also Malay Sultanate. And uh, based on, uh, I think I can go straight, eh? before I proceed, I just, uh, these are some of the example I showed uh, Makkah. This is before, eh? before February, I was able to visit Makkah to do my Umrah, Masjid, Masjid uh, Nabawi, and then the, below is a uh, Kulia of Architecture. You can see the reflection of an uh, Islamic uh, pattern, and also uh, Putrajaya. Putrajaya is one of the uh, of the uh, big city in Malaysia, uh, which apply uh, Islamic uh, doctrine, Islamic uh, planning doctrine, emphasizes uh, emphasize on the relationship between uh, man and Allah, man and man and man and environment. So th these are more pictures to see when we talk about Islamic uh, built environment, not only we talk about the religious building, but also we talk about the whole, the whole spectrum of built environment, the whole spectrum of architecture, uh, on housing, office, uh, recreational, and so on. So the overall built environment. So you can see some example in Istanbul, Turkey, so you can see the ambience and, and Granada, I showed some of the example there. And I visited uh, Granada twice. Uh, the last one was 2018, the first one 2006. You, you can see the example, the pattern there, the, the, the internal, yeah, the, this, this uh, interior of Granada. Uh, the row that uh, this building was, uh, you know, was designed and constructed, they take from Al Quran and Hadis. Yeah? But, uh, uh, for example, they talk about river, water, yeah? and you look at uh, Istanbul also the same. So uh, the 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 professional architect then yeah? they are very uh, well versed about Quran and so on. So that's why the architecture is very close to uh, to Islam. Yeah? So this is the content of my presentation. What is Islam? Introduction to the environment from, Is from Islamic perspective, the coming of Islam in Malaysia, the Islamic environment in Malaysian context. So I talk a little bit on Malaysian housing and the influence of Islam, university design and the conclusion. So what is Islam? Literally, submission, surrender, safety, protection and peace. Technically, it can be understood from four aspects. First, total submission to God or to God's will. This refers to the broader and general meaning that everything submit and dependent on God. All creatures demonstrate their creator's glory. All creatures, what does it mean? Human being, gene, animals, plants, eh? hills, and so on. Second, it implies the region of Tawhid or total submission to the one God brought by all the prophets. Surah Al Imran, uh, uh, 384. Three eighty-four, page eighty-four to eighty-five. It is also called Din Al Qayyim or Anif, Surah An Nal. Third refers to the religion specifically named by God to the one established by Prophet Muhammad, Surah Al Maida, which manifests the final and the most complete form of the religious of Tawhid brought by the previous prophets. So we have many prophets, but uh, the most important one is the twenty-five prophets. Islam, in this sense, means to submit and to practice whatever commanded by God through Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there are two, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fourth refers to the outward practices, rituals of the religion, as distinguished from the inner aspect of the religion. It refers to the five pillars of Islam: shahada, 
prayers, fasting, zakat, and hajj. This I got obtained from Assistant Professor Dr. Ismail bin Mamad, 2020. He was invited to our kuliah to enhance our Islamic knowledge. So uh, this information I gathered from him and I learned a lot. So another important uh, information here, as Muslim believers, our highest ultimate sources of knowledge and wisdom, principles and values, norms and guidance are the glories of Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May the peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, his family, and his companion. For us believers, it is Quran and Sunnah that we accept as the highest authorities in our lives. So, what does it mean from this? In in Islam, yeah, in Islam, all human being, we have to do Two things, fardu kifayah and fardu ain. Yeah? Fardu ain, we have to pray five times a day. So those uh, wajib activities we have to perform. The fardu kifayah is other things. For example, today I'm teaching, uh, teaching, uh, working, and others. Those is under fardu kifayah. So what I learned from UIA, in the morning, every day before I come to UIA, I will do doa. Sahaja aku menjalankan tugas sebanyak hari ini kerana Allah Taala. So included, including both fardu kifayah and fardu ain. Yeah. So now the Quran, holy book for Muslim, it tells you uh, of your Creator, of His attributes, of how He rules over the cosmos. Can we? Can I move my picture so that I can read better? Uh, of how he relates himself to you and how you relate, how you should relate to him, to yourself and to your fellow men and to every other being. Muslim obligation to read, understand and follow the Quran. The first one is very important. Yeah? How you should relate to him, to yourself and to your fellow men. Meaning, we talk about one, our oneself. Then we talk our family. Yeah? Relationship with our family, relationship with our community, relationship uh, no, with our community yes or neighbors the relationship with our with the cities bigger picture housing uh, you know housing uh, estate and so on and then to the states negeri eh? and then to country and then to our global from country to country so meaning this uh, uh, th this is what is taught by quran the relationship between men and men yeah? And then Muslim uh, obligation to read, uh, understand, and follow the Quran, the Sunnah. The word Sunnah means method, example, or path referring to what the noble prophet said, did, and agreed to. The prophet Sunnah emphasizes the nature needs and disposition of every human being. The Quran commanded us to do good for God loves those who do good. The Sunnah of the prophet provides more detailed guidance on doing good, example, the practice of charity and sadaqah. Sharia, what is Sharia? The Islamic moral and legal system de derived from Quran and Sunnah. The Sharia also recognizes local customary law of any place so long as it is not conflict with Quran and Sunnah. Just now I show you different uh, cities in the world. We saw Istanbul, Granada, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Mecca, Madinah and so on. The law is Islamic. But the people, the culture, people, culture, uh, the practice of religion, the physical, the architecture, not necessarily the same, especially the architecture. Uh, uh, yeah, because uh, uh, we have to refer to climate and others. The purpose is to realize and secure the general good or the interests of people by promoting their welfare and keeping away harm, preventing their vital needs, do, uh, do ruriat, catering for their requirements, uh, hajiyat, Allowing for betterment, enhancement, and improvement. So anything that is good, uh, is good and and uh, in accordance to Quran and Sunnah, so we can practice. The vital is in in order uh, are five: the din protection of religion, nafs protection of life, akal protection of intellect, protection of lineage, nasab, and wealth protection of property. So these are the the things that we should consider. A, a, to follow our Sharia, so these are the five things. So what I can learn from this, whatever is good that we do for for human being, for animals, for you know our planet, 
for human being as long as we follow uh, and protect uh, people and and life uh, this is what we are supposed to do and we follow the sharia this is uh, from my very good friend uh, Dr. Dr. Rawida uh, in UAE they wanted us to be Murabi yeah? Murabi in the context of architecture pedagogy is a teacher with concise and responsibility towards the creator almighty Allah mankind and environment the task is to produce graduates as architects and architecture letter caliphs or stewards to enhance the built environment in god envision or tawhidic uh, approach so when i first uh, joined uia when people ask me what when people ask me what is so islamic about this architecture i wasn't able to answer so because my knowledge about al quran sunnah and so on is very very little bro islamic bro is not within me I was, uh, you know, I was uh, educated uh, overseas for eight years in Australia and UK. So my knowledge about Islam was also very, very basic. So by by knowing this uh, knowledge, uh, it comes to to you. That's why I feel, you know, when I was appointed to be a lecturer at UAE, now already twenty two years, I never feel tired teaching students. If uh, my head of department give me 19 credit hours or more subjects to teach, I never say no because the more I teach, the more I learn. And it is my responsibility to teach my students. Some of them are very fast, some of them moderate, some of them slow in understanding architecture. So it is my responsibility to teach. That's why I don't mind if my students call me at night or any time WhatsApp me to explain because I was paid by UIA to serve my student because they are my client. Okay, little bit of a vision of IIUM. Uh, aims to become leading international center of education excellence, which seek to restore the dynamic and progressive role of the Muslim Ummah in all branches of knowledge and intellectual discourse. So how can we combine or integrate Islamic and architecture? So the integration is the values, the good values, Sharia compliance that we have to impact or uh, we have to teach our student mission is to achieve the triple ICE integration Islamization internationalization comprehensive accident uh, the whole as a whole eh? so the vision for my kuliah to be center of excellence for the environment that promotes integration and Islamization of knowledge for the benefits of the ummah so my task here in UIA is to teach students whether they are in the majority are Muslim so that they become uh, Muslim uh, technocrat, yeah? jiwa besar, jiwa de besar. At the same time, they are technocrats. They believe in Allah. They are strong uh, in uh, practicing uh, sunnah and so on. Uh, so the mission uh, of Kaed uh, follow through uh, uh, by uh, producing ethical, competent, versatile graduates by applying the Tawhidic approach. So just now I show you the video. So this is what. IIUM has produced for the past 22 years. We have done trail of Islamic heritage study. This is where we learn about the, the Islamic civilization throughout the world. What can we learn about the leaders before? Their strength, jiwa yang kuat. How they managed to construct building so beautiful in Alhambra Grandanda. You know? uh, uh, precision, uh, they are good in medicine, they are good in architecture, they are good in engineering. They are very Islamic, they read Quran, they are Tafis. Yeah? So there are many. So I visited uh, uh, and see uh, some of these in Spain, in, in Iran, uh, in Syria, and so on. Yeah? So in India, we have done uh, mainly most of the, uh, the case study that we did was in India, Turkey, uh, Syria, Egypt, Iran, Indonesia, Malaysia, and China, as well as Bangladesh. So in China, we have... Uh, a lot of good architecture, especially the masjid, yeah? and Islam came to China through Silk Road, and Islam come to Indonesia, Malaysia through Spice Road. Yeah, dua, yeah? Satu jalan sutera, satu jalan rempah. So you can see uh, the architecture, a majority of the heritage of the past are very strong, yeah? functional, and, and they are also sustainable because they don't use a lot of electricity, uh, uh, very nice uh, ventilation and so on. Even in Malaysia, we have very nice uh, traditional Malay house and so on. Eh? So now uh, I go through uh, further to see uh, more uh, information that we gather from Al-Quran. 
that talk about built environment. In Islam, all this have been created with purpose, with objective, and in proportion and measure both qualitative and quantitative, al Qamar uh, Ayat 49. The role of environment is to to worship its Lord and Creator and to be subjected to man who is around. Man must respect the environment in that he is dependent on it. Man cannot but co coexist with the environment, giving away and receiving in return proportionally to what he offered. We, you know, every day, the last one month, we talk about uh, water, uh, river, uh, the water from Selangor River has have been polluted. This is due to the uh, the bad manners of human being. They throw bad things to the river. They don't respect the environment. So respect to the environment, human must treat it kindly, kindly and gently, and not to cause damages to his surroundings. So as an architect, you don't have to build, bulldoze or cut everything, cut trees and everything, so that you can do a lot of development. So this is already written in Quran. You have to be very careful. So God is angry. Now God is very angry. That's, that's why they send COVID-19 to all human beings throughout the world because we are destroying. We polluted the air, we polluted the water, we polluted the sea, we throw rubbish and so on. So this is one indicator that God sent his army. So how should we human beings behave? Quoted in our Quran, when Ibrahim said, my Lord, make it a secure town, provide its people with fruits such as of them, such of them as believe in Allah. And the last day he said, and whoever disbelief, I will grant him enjoyment for a short while, then I will drive him to the chest chestiment of fire and it's an evil destination, Al-Baqarah, Ayat 126. More information, in Islam, house is a place to rest, relax one body and mind, enjoy legitimate world lady lies as well as to worship, teach, learn and propagate the message of Islam. It is one of the fu fundamental rights that must be enjoyed by every Muslim. So what can we learn about this? Sometimes you have your high rise building next to a bungalow. Yeah, you can see many of these in the big town. Yeah. So the bungalow do not have any privacy. There are, there are cases where you have lots of land, but your lot is very far from the road, the main road. But your neighbor, who is very close to the road, must give access to you. So this is bagi jalan, bagi jalan lalu. You, you not only um, uh, give road access, but also ventilation. This is from the spirit of Islam. According to Imam Al-Ghazali, having a dwelling force within the basic necessities, oh. it must be sought by every everyone. So it's like office causes people to be displeased with God and even sometimes to deny him. Uh, this is what I've highlighted for the master planning or the implementation of Putrajaya, they are using this, the planning doctrine. So one of the author is Professor Dr. Ismail Mizain. He was unable to get, he was not able with us today because he has had the appointment, but he wished me, yeah, good luck. So this is important, men and the creator. And then men and men, men environment. So uh, comprehensive, men is the focus of development, multi-dimensional activities, quantitative and quality change, equitable utilization and distribution of resources. So we have to, so all architects, uh, all consultants in the built environment, the civil engineer, landscape architect, town planner, they have to have this in their mind eh, as our uh, what is, uh, rule. Eh, rule. Uh, now I go uh, further. Look at, look at the users in the built environment. Yeah? Self. Then we have our family. We have our community, we have our cities, countries, and global. So Islam looking from this angle. And then we must know who are the users. And then uh, from our architecture uh, knowledge, we call user-centric in the environment. Yeah, We consider the users from the womb to the tomb, able body and disabled body. So we have children, we have adolescents, we have adults, we have elderly, as well as infant. If you look at this cross-section, and now in our built environment throughout the world, the percentage of elderly are increasing. For example, by 2050, Japan, 15% of their population with, uh, sorry, uh, if I don't say 30%, 35% of their population will be above 65 by the year 2050. Maknanya every 100%, 35 will be elderly. 
then we have to consider children, infant, adolescent, and else. so all these people are very, very important for us as designer to consider them to live in, in our built environment, safety, security, able to go to work, job opportunity, able to go uh, to uh, I mean, tourism, information and so on. Because when we talk about able and disabled, uh, for the disabled, there are two groups. Person with disability, those are wheelchair, user, blind, uh, you know, deaf, walking with stick, autism, learning disability, mental retarded, and so on. Those are under disabled person. But aging population in Malaysia are increasing. So the, oh. the percentage of uh, dementia is high. Dementia, there is no cure. Yet I know bad. The percentage of dementia is high. The percentage of elderly people closely related to disability. So our built environment, for me, should be accessible, should be uh, reachable, should have connectivity and seamless journey. So now I bring you to Malaysia, a little bit, going back again. This is what I have lighted to you, Alam Melayu, yeah, we are Malays, majority is Alam Melayu, before uh, we were colonized, we are one, yeah? before British came, before Dutch, came and so on. So Islam spread through uh, Empire, Empire Funan, Angkor Funan, coming down to the you know, southern of Thailand, also in southern of Filipina, Borneo, uh, this one, uh, Jambi, uh, Sumatra, Jawa and so on. So these are all. That's why the population of, of Islam, the biggest is in uh, Indonesia. Yeah? The, the percentage is big. So what we are doing today, thank you to uh, Prof K, uh, is, is very good. Because we are looking as a whole, yeah? when we design our building as a whole, yeah? globally, not only at uh, at our house level, but a global level. The coming of Islam, little bit I have I have already highlighted. Uh, the coming of Islam in Malaysia, a replica of Trengganu Stone inscription at historical museum Kuala Lumpur. So it was uh, the stone inscription Kuala Lumpur Trengganu written in Arabic script and constituting an order to pro promulgate certain Islamic laws. Yeah? Uh, it was uh, in 702 yeah? uh, by Fatini 1963. So this is one of our evidence that Islam has arrived in uh, Malaysia yeah, through uh, Terengganu. So so more, more importantly, here we talk about masjid. Yeah? Uh, when Islam come, they always construct uh, masjid. Yeah? Uh, for for us, uh, Islam come uh, via a uh, 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 Laluan uh, spice route uh, by the you know people from Middle East yeah? through India or through uh, Yemen and so on. They come down to uh, Malaysia as a business people uh, as business person, and they distrib they marry to the local uh, and some uh, through business. Yeah? So during that time, a lot of masjid yeah, was constructed not only in Malaysia but also in many parts of. Indonesia and so on, yeah? in Banten, in Jawa, you know, uh, Dema and so on. So those were constructed about uh, in the 15th century or earlier than that. The earliest mosque, uh, uh, for example, in Malaysia, the earliest mosque was uh, Kampung uh, Laut uh, Masjid in Kelantan. Yeah? This one was written by Halina. And then the multicultural nature of Malaysian society. Yeah? Now we go beyond. So not only we talk, we talk about masjid, uh, madrasa and so we go beyond yeah we have uh, many uh, col colonial building yeah and so on uh, and then we have um, you know, all sort of architecture after independence we have all sort of architecture in malaysia influenced by by uh, you know modern architecture where the architects got their education let's say if they are graduated from uk they brought their knowledge from uk from australia from us and so on so champorization, yeah, berbancam-bancam, all sort of architecture. And then we forget our, from our Quran and Sunnah. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, some of, of the masjid uh, have uh, you know, circular shape divided by two, uh, sometimes the hexagon shape uh, with columns in between. So this is not right, yeah, because uh, good architecture is what we see, uh, you know, um, that rectangular shape is the best option. The first line, the first line will be the highest makmum. Uh, the, 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 the first row will be the, the larger number of makmum and so on. 
So those are the knowledge that we should learn. So these are the earlier architecture that we see. Uh, I've been to these places, Masjid Kampung Laut Kelantan. Uh, I, I haven't been, but this one through, um, through, through literature, but I've been to Wadi Al Hussein Masjid, Teluk Mano, Naratiwat. You can see the architecture very strong. You feel different. Eh? Roh de Lain, eh? uh, non Nels and so on. And there is another one, Surau Aur, Manang Yong District Patani. This one, they moved this building to, to this place. So what can we learn from this these two buildings? And the, the top, the top one move. Masjid Kampung Laut ni dipindahkan. So majority of the Malay architecture, traditional Malay architecture for masjid, they already apply IBS, industrial building system, pasang siap. Yeah? Including Malay uh, traditional house. This is what we can, one of the contribution of traditional Malay house as well as traditional masjid. Boleh dipindah-pindah, boleh cabut pasang balik. Yeah? Uh, now I got a little bit on the housing, yeah? Malaysian housing and influence of Islam. So uh, for your information, in 2005, I was in, I can't remember 2005 or 2006, I was in Oxford then during my sabbatical. Um, I received a call from uh, RMC UIA that uh, I was asked to do uh, research in uh, Brunei. Actually, my knowledge then was not that much about housing from Islamic perspective, but I managed to finish one research in Malaysia uh, on similar topic, housing from Islamic perspective, three case study, it was in Putrajaya, Subang Jaya, and Subang Jaya, if I'm not mistaken, the other one in Shahalam, uh, three case study, <coughs> looking at, uh, uh, at various criteria from Islamic perspective. And I use similar methodology, and I do, uh, 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 I, I do uh, that research in Brunei uh, to, to see um, uh, what is the expected outcome because the title uh, given to me is almost similar. But uh, Alhamdulillah, because Malaysia, we, we have uh, uh, many races yeah? um, compared to Brunei. Brunei, their population, uh, majority Muslim people, number one. Number two, uh, Sultan of Brunei. Uh, Alhamdulillah, he has a very strong uh, leadership, especially in implementing uh, Quran and Sunnah uh, in the built environment. You can see this. You feel very, very different if you go to Brunei. I, I do not know. I feel um, one thing for sure. This country, it is a safe country. Yeah. The architecture that they have, not to show off. The, the size is just nice for the Brunei people. And then when, when I distribu distributed the questionnaire, I was helped by the pegawai daerah. If I'm not mistaken, it's Muara, uh, Kausa Muara. Eh? Um, and I was I would like to thank also uh, Dr. Pengera Osman. I think he's here from Brunei. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Thank you for listening. And I was informed Puja is distributing, distributing this uh, uh, poster. Eh? Um, to Puja is a uh, pertumbuhan Puja uh, Uko uh, Jurutera and Architect in Brunei distributed. I think I learned a lot from, from uh, Brunei. So the ambience, the architecture, the people, yeah, the people, uh, they are more Islam, not the word, uh, understanding of Islamic built environment. They, they understand the, the, the application uh, of this uh, concept or this criteria of Islamic housing, they really practice in their housing. I think, uh, to, I would say, uh, one of the best examples uh, through my experience. I've been to Pakistan. I've been to Marina. I've visited my friends, uh, Parit uh, Mustafa over there, and I learned their architecture as well, and so on. Uh, 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 so, they, uh, I mean, a different culture, a different uh, person, uh, group of person, uh, so the architecture is slightly different. For example, kalau kita pergi Madinah atau Pakistan, the fence is very high compared to Malaysia and uh, Brunei. They are, their fence look up to six feet high, so that they could, they cannot see the ladies from outside. So those are some of the things that I learned from them. So this is, uh, you know, if you look at the influence of Islam in traditional Malay house, uh, you can read from this. There are a lot of things that we can learn.
Yeah? Did I go straight to the next one? How to go to the next one? Oh, next slide. Okay, uh, this is the information that I gather. A few characteristics of Islamic, uh, of Islamic, a few characteristics of Islamic environment, especially on housing, have been identified, which many of them have been fulfilled by Malay tradition houses. Among those characteristics are privacy for both visual and acoustic, layout plan, segregation between male and female, segregation between public and private spaces, providing separate room for bathing, housing uh, scheme orientation, uh, decoration, moderation expenses, and cleaning. Them. So these are the criteria that we found from the Malay traditional houses. Eh? Malay traditional houses, if you come to my kampung, uh, Rambau di Smilan, especially my kampung, Sapri, all the houses, traditional Malay houses in my kampung, all are facing to Kiblat, 90%, uh, 90 degrees eh? are facing to Kiblat. So my house is more than 100 years, meaning, the knowledge of our great 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 uh, grandfathers before me, they are very knowledgeable and aware about the requirement for Islamic built environment. So I think, I mean, kita kadang-kadang pun, uh, the, the young architects or the young generation or the owners of the building, they are not familiar with this. So the old people are much, much, uh, I mean, they are more informed. So we go straight to this one, Surah Anal. Surah An-Nal, it is God who made your habitation, homes of rest and quiet for you, and made for you out of skin of animals, tents for dwellings, which you find so light and handy when you travel and you stop in your travel and out of their wool and their soft fibers between wool and hair, and their hair rich stuff, as, stuff and articles of convenience to serve you for a time. This one already written in the in Quran. Eh? Guna kulit binatang sebagai kemah, eh? dwellings. Yeah? So these are all. It's written already. Yusuf Kondrawi defined the house which is in accordance to the Quran services, the place in which an individual protects himself from the climatic impacts and in which he finds freedom from the restriction and pressures of society. Basically, it is a place of rest for the body and the recession as well as peace for mind. So this is from Safaik Omar, yeah, my friend. Uh, they talk about Islamic culture and civilization as much as individual and families bred and nurtured they in constitute the fundamental units of Islamic Ummah. Therefore, a house has a potential to take up the role of an educational and training center which are able to produce healthy and potential society member. So another one by Kamruddin Muhammad No, he claimed that the typical Islamic house, house has been designed based on the function nature of the family and its social role. The house is expected to respond to lifestyle, culture and comfort, economics, geographical condition, building material and as well as techniques. So Islamic architecture is determined primarily by function or use and not by form. So coming back to this, to this uh, so uh, for your information, uh, I would like to thank UNTAN, Univ University Tanjumpura uh, Pontiana. They invited me twice to talk about um, about traditional Malay house as well as my state, I think in July this year. So um, I think the third seminar that we have with uh, Prof. Rudin uh, and his team is the continuous, yeah? because we go from the traditional to masjid, now we go detail to housing. So we can we can relate this, um, you know, uh, because based on, on, on the previous pictures that I showed you, when we talk about architecture, in Spain, architecture in, in uh, Morocco, and the architecture in India as well, and mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. the form are not the same because we have heavy rain and hot, so we, we have lots of pitch roof compared to them because they have less rain. So this is what we mentioned here. Yeah? So it's determined by the function, yeah? not by a form. That's why when you look at uh, Machek Kampung Laut, the roof is like, the building is just like a house. Similarly to the two examples that I showed you in south of Thailand. If you look at first time, it's just like a house, but they are masjid, yeah? So uh, so this is, this is 
this is reflected to the uh, the local architecture of um, ASEAN region, especially Thailand and Malaysia, to use pitch roof, uh, direct uh, cross ventilation, and so on. Can you go to the next one? Okay, this is more information. Uh, a place where they are basic necessities of food and clothing, uh, referred in Quran, where men are eaten together, where there is hospitality and generosity, a place where greeting salam, a place where love, tenderness, and mercy in the, in, is the norm of the Quran say, if we have met between you, love and tenderness. Smiling is charity, a place to recite Al Quran, a place to salad, and so on. Yeah? So these are all. Uh, the information that we gather from our Quran talking about the condition or the situation of our housing. Oh. So these are more detailed. I'm not going to read uh, one by one, but I'm sure you can read uh, all this, yeah, which is related to house. Yeah? So a little bit about uh, neighborhood. Uh, we go to the residential area. Yeah, neighborhood unit or residential area is defined as a place for people to live and doing activities. Within the context of Islamic urbanism, not only refers to the physical aspect, but also covered all spiritual value like religious, community, and human civilization. A scholar, Galza Haider, defined the ideal Islamic city as an area where the residents living based on criteria of faith, law, iman, sharia, vast gerency, khilafah, Elms, sadaqah, economy, taqwa, knowledge, thinking, environment, hardworking, unity, justice, jihad, loyal, and beauty. So this is included in our Islamic neighborhood as well as our um, built environment. More information? Yeah, more, this is more information. Uh, they talk about uh, Ashafi and Hanafi defined dwellers of 40 houses from every angle are considered as neighbors. This is where you need uh, to have your masjid, yeah? Papulo, Papulo Rumah. Yeah? So these are uh, more detailed uh, by uh, Maliki uh, Imam, Imam Hanafi, Imam Shafi'i, and as well as Maliki. They talk about neighbors. Yeah? So uh, now we go more detail, Islamic housing. So I visited uh, Iran. I visited uh, uh, Syria. <clears throat> I'm referring to their houses, not the modern houses. Yeah? So they separate between uh, male and female, yeah, and the lelaki and perempuan, as well as um, as well as uh, guests. So very strong separation. Yeah. So the application, uh, even uh, the knockers, the knockers at the door, it is different for a male as well as the female. If you go to Iran Iranian house, you have two knockers. So you don't if it the the rough sound for the male. The, the, the finest sound is for the female. So those are indicators for the owner of the house, of the house, whether their guests are male or female. So they talk more about um, harem, domestic area, uh, more information related to tidiness, cleanliness, and so on. Yeah? So now we talk about privacy, visual privacy. Yeah. Uh, when I did uh, my case study in Brunei, yeah, uh, especially rumah atas air, rumah atas air, the, the door of the house is not directly to the door of the front. I think that is very, very good. So you tak nampak eh, straight to the other house. So it is good if you have, you are designed terrace houses, your door not directly to the front door of different houses. Visual privacy, acoustical privacy, the material that you use between one room to another room, High height and high projection. Height and high projection also very important so that people do not people do not peep through your windows. Yeah? These are this is related to privacy layout uh, facing uh, Kiblat if you if you can. But there is a question when I presented a paper in Shalam, uh, attended by uh, relig uh, ustaz, uh, ustaz and um, uh, those who learn religion. They asked me. Uh, they asked me whether for the room, sometimes when you pray, you are facing the toilet. Yeah? You are facing the toilet. So they ask, they ask me whether is it possible not to face to the toilet. 
Uh, so there are two opinions here. When we do housing project, <coughs> the layout of the building to bermacam-macam arah. Yeah? Sometimes, sometimes you have terrace houses or semi-D houses, but the design of each building to sama. So we are not able to move. Let's say it just happened when you position the semi-detached, when you pray facing the kiblat, but you are praying to the to the toilet. But the, to the toilet to the dinding, you have walls. So for me, because there is, there is nothing in the toilet because you already flush and your toilet is clean and you have walls. So it is okay for you to pray to facing kiblat, but in this case facing to the uh, bathroom. Segregation between men and female, segregation between public and private space, public, semi public, and private, providing specific room for bathing, house orientation, decoration, moderation in expenses, and cleaning. These are all the characteristics of Islamic housing. So, more information related, related to Islamic principle, they talk about uh, human activities, about socio cultural, economy, and so on. And then we talk about um, policy, uh, total plan doctrine, which I've already highlighted before. Yeah. Now this is the book that that uh, I wrote together with uh, Professor uh, I think Pangeran Adnan from Brunei, uh, Dr. Pangeran uh, Osman also from and and his team. Yeah? And uh, I had uh, a lot of support from them, uh, especially from their technical uh, group. Uh, when we did this uh, and to collect the data as well. So um, this one was uh, quite long ago, uh, about 14 years ago, but I just show you uh, the findings then. But uh, from 2006 until now, uh, I did a lot of heritage study in various uh, uh, country in the world, looking at, I already told you, the, uh, the Islamic civilization, the culture, and so on. So these are the examples. Uh, there are six case uh, study. The majority of the houses, this is the rumah Aye. This is rumah Aye. You see, there are a lot of bedrooms. So separation or segregation between men and female are there. So the yellow is the public area. Yeah? This is family and kitchen. Two entrances, one for one to through the kitchen and the other one to the main entrance. Normally the ladies, you know, they come from the, the other way. Or sometimes they can use the main entrance. So this is the interior of the house. This is uh, this is uh, the project uh, uh, done by the government of Brunei, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where the rumah air uh, was burned down. <coughs> was burned down, so they they constructed new uh, unit. The, uh, they have four bedrooms, very comfortable two bedroom, uh, four bedrooms, and they have toilet. One thing is uh, interesting about Brunei. They have toilet, they call it suka duka. Suka duka. Suka tu wedding lah kot. Yeah, they have bigger toilet, good for their people, uh, visitors. Uh, duka tu uh, meninggal. Yeah? During that time, 2006, now maybe it's different, I do not know. Uh, maybe uh, they have to bring the, you know, the mayat to masjid or something like that. But majority of the case study, they have uh, that this is the example. So they have one unit, one banglo to another banglo. Yeah? This is all floating. Uh, and then the in entrance of the door, not facing to the entrance to the other door. So indirectly, they already applied the Islamic uh, uh, approach. Yeah? So these are the example. So everything, the masjid, the scholar, everything on the on the on the water, uh, petrol station, and everything. Very interesting. Uh, I was in Brunei, I think last year again. I was there twice. They have even done a, a very nice um, improvement. Terrace houses, a lot of construction on the river. And they have improved the waterfront. And their waterfront are very accessible because I was using, uh, you know, with chairs sometimes. So I tested the ground. So I think they have, uh, they have done a lot of improvement in terms of their built environment. Yeah? This is uh, all the details. Yeah? Very, very safe. See? Yeah. Very nice. This is another house. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very nice. I just go through very quickly. Okay, question. Another one. Uh, this one, the last one. I like this house because uh, 
the owner managed to buy the land, the lot facing facing to Qibla 90 degrees. So uh, they have one room at the back here, any room, separated from the main building. Uh, this is more, they need more privacy so that the the assistant or the bed didn't come into the house during night time. I think this is quite uh, interesting uh, architecture. A nice prayer room facing to the to the kiblat eh? and so on. So these are the example. So I would like to add because just now I mentioned to you regarding. Um, uh, I will stop uh, another two minutes regarding application of university design. We understood in our building environment we have a we have uh, able body and disabled. So it is important to make sure our build environment are usable are usable by everybody. So the application of university design is very, very important. Eh? So this this is uh, more information which you can uh, refer to. Yeah. So more hadiths, uh, more hadiths and as well as from Al Quran, eh? fulfilling the rights of the disabled, elderly and the poor. What I worry, what I worry, we forget about this group of people. So the elderly who are disabled are not able to go out from their house. What happened if we professional, elderly professional, who like to enjoy traveling, tourism and so on, if the, the built environment inside or outside building are not accessible, they have to stay. So, so I hope all the professional architect or designers must consider accessibility, uh, seamless journey. Even it is written here, wajib ni. Yeah? Uh, Nabi Muhammad pun dah suruh dah ni. It, it, riwayat ni semua hadis eh. And then this one written uh, in Quran, Al-Hujurat. Activity and caring and compassionate society. So we have to respect this group of people. In Malaysia, if I add the elderly plus disabled person, more than 3 million. More than 3 million. I'm also in the you know, aging group society so i do not want to change my lifestyle my lifestyle i need to you know to do to go uh, wherever i i need to go but now i use all uh you know lane uh okay you lane especially traveling before yeah? so this is more information responsibility responsibility of the mess yeah you but our prophet has won in such a strict manner against misleading the blind away to respect the blind person, vision impaired. Because yeah? such is he who mislead a blind person away from his path by Albani. Prohibition of isolating them and the harms that may follow. Rewired Muslim. So this is more impo very important eh? to support this group of people. So you, we must give them opportunity. Uh, this I like to show this picture. From number one to number eight are users in our built environment. So we must cater for everybody, yeah? So that they can have access, continuous access, uh, accessibility and connectivity. So if you consider the disabled and the aging, so the whole built environment will be good for everybody. So in university design, we have vertical movement and horizontal. Vertical movement meaning we have our leaf, talking, talking leaf with braille. And then you have to consider what about if you bring the deaf person inside the lift. So what what are you going to how you can improve your lift? Horizontal uh, scalation, uh, your your uh, pedestrian walkway and so on. Yeah, these are all the facilities that you must provide in various type of building typology for person with disability. Yeah, and we need to train our reception, our security guard, uh, sign language to assist that. Uh, uh, here in PET, little bit about national standard, MS1184. Now we are revising. 2020, we are revising this uh, document because we identify more uh, building typology need to be more accessible, including housing and so on, yeah? heritage area and so on. So this is on asset management for masjid, um, national standard for masjid. And then we have for public toilet, yeah, and so on. So in conclusion, the diversity of variety in the Islamic environment can be revealed in case for a better education knowledge in architecture to be learned and practiced in the reality world of environment. All professional in the environment should include Islamic values in their practice. Yeah? So I highlighted that as well as Islamic criteria. Yeah? 
And then in order to have a good Islamic environment, we have to closely follow Quran and Sunnah as our guidance. And also the Sharia compliance. It is recommended that the Malay tradition house and traditional village approach can be used in our modern planning. Yeah? For example, in Putrajaya, we have, uh, uh, they have uh, followed this uh, through and also to have respect to our people, yeah? the respect uh, neighborhood, and then we consider privacy and so on. With that, I end my uh, my paper this afternoon with uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So thank you for the very interesting presentation. So dear participants, now we come to the Q and A session. Um, I think uh, before that, uh, we receive a few questions in the chat box. Uh, we will start with the the question number one. Uh, the participant from uh, A R Yes Yusuf. Uh, as a prof, um, is asking about you keep mentioning uh, the role of the building right. to elaborate the, on the role. Bro, eh? Yeah. The spirit. Eh? So uh, I'll give you an example. Eh? I'll give you an example. Uh, the, uh, as a Muslim, we have certain, uh, we, we, are, we are taught to behave in certain ways. If you follow the Sunnah. Eh? I remember there was one uh, lady who is, who is also an expert about uh, housing from Islamic perspective. Um, for example, uh, kita nak masuk toilet kan? Normally when we enter the toilet, we use our left leg. Kan? Jadi pintu tu buka ke mana? Bukanya guna tangan kanan ke? So the positioning of the door, door lift. Number one. Number two, when we, when we wanted to enter the house, somebody's house. Normally when you stand, this is the values. You don't stand directly in front of the door. You cut a piece sikit. I remember my good friend, uh, Dato' Wal Muhammad, yeah? he was the ex uh, ex uh, director general of Jakim. I remember he came to my house. Dia tak duduk depan pintu. Dia duduk tepi pintu. Jadi bila you buka pintu, when you open the door, you don't see him. You, dia, mana dia, he, he respected me. Re, re, later I realized, when you when you go to somebody's house, do not, it's, because sometimes you didn't dress up properly or something like that. So uh, he's, he's, he stood away from the from the door not direct so that's uh, uh, number two um uh, uh, values so uh, this are uh, uh, i mean architecture build environment in order to have the islamic uh, values to the datang daripada owner and also the architect who designed the building for them uh, this is what i wanted to say for example friendly to the users so you include the universal uh, design in in the in the building so that all users, especially the disabled, can have opportunity for education to go to school and so on. Jadi dia ada roh lah pada bangunan tu, or else the disabled will be complaining they are not able to go to school because there is no lift. They are not able to go to the park because the park has many drops and so on. So these are the the Islamic perspective um, to make people uh, to make uh, the public. To have its movement from one place to another, from inside building to outside building, and continuously. Thank you. Okay, Prof. Uh, the second question is come from Siti Hamida Abdul Hamid regarding does an Islamic housing design consider on the ritual man of Mandi's jenazah? What is the criteria of a, if any? Ah, uh, Mandi jenazah here. Yeah. Uh, the the best option is to have bigger toilet. To have bigger one of the one of the toilet must be bigger. This is what I learned from Brunei. They have uh, bilik duka. They call it bilik duka. It is written in the planning uh, requirement. Eh? Bilik duka meaning if you have a uh, dead body, uh, mayat, eh? so they can uh, mandikan the bilik uh, yang besar sekali. So most of the houses that I showed you, majority I think about five houses. No, one, two, three. Uh, the bungalow, the three bungalows, they have bigger toilet on the ground floor. 
Okay, uh, any participant would like to ask uh, Dato, uh, Prof. Dato uh, directly? Please unmute or speak. You can have an open uh, Q&A session. Anyone? Assalamualaikum, Prof. Dato Sri. How are you? Assalamualaikum. <laughs> Okay, Prof, uh, thank you uh, for sharing your priceless experience with us. How do you see the future of Malaysia? I mean, moving towards the uh, their awareness and uh, consideration of having universal design in uh, designing mosques and other buildings in Malaysia, Prof. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shamzani. Uh, for me, uh, we have... Uh, the Disabled Act, which was written uh, in 2008, and and also MS 1184. In Malaysia, there are two types of standard. One standard is voluntary, the other one is compulsory or mandatory. So Malaysian standard for facilities for the disabled is under mandatory, and it is written in UBBL. In UBBL, it is written, you have to refer to MS 11 Eight four and MS one three three one to provide facilities for the disabled. Now, now what I wanted to inform you, that two thousand two hundred two hundred twenty. So the knowledge that the technical person, be it uh, architect or engineer, that you have learned, and those who are practicing, you must you must apply this. You must provide facilities for the disabled in your built environment in future. And for your mention, I think local authority. They are they are aware. For example, uh, Putrajaya, Provident Putrajaya, they provide a um, uh, checklist what to prefer, what to be provided uh, by the architect and so on. So they check. I think uh, the BKL also do the same. Even they have a unit for the they have the disabled unit to look after uh, all the drawings uh, before approval. So they and many more, including MPP Pineng. Eh? Penang, uh, Majlis Perbadaran uh, Shah Alam, uh, Subhanjaya, uh, PJ, uh, and uh, even in the Gris Milan. So the, the aura or the vibes uh, are very positive towards uh, providing facilities for the disabled. In this case, uh, in Malaysia, including Sabah and Sarawak in KK, they, ha they have improved a lot. And in Kuching Waterfront, I did the access audit in 2008. I visited many times, they have improved. Uh, especially um, near the Hilton, the waterfront, and opposite and opposite um, what we as well. Uh, sorry, Prof. Sri, uh, if I may ask another question. Uh, well, recently uh, the government has uh, presented the latest budget for Malaysia, and I think I saw a good in uh, initiative for the uh, our PW friends. Uh, we'd like to give some comments and view on that matter, Prof. Yeah, I think uh, our friend Rasadi Bhai has done a good job. And the Minister of uh, Women, uh, YB Menteri, as well all the uh, uh, all the officers, KSU and so on, I think they have uh, considered all the views from this group, the disabled, the elderly people, by providing better uh, funds for them. So I think a big congratulations to this mystery and all the hard work uh, from the ministry and the staff. Thank you, Prof. Sri. Terima kasih, yeah. There was a uh, question there. Uh, okay, yes. Any question? Yes, uh, Prof. I have a question. Hello? Yeah, yeah, I'm listening. I'm ah, listening, okay. yes. Uh, I'm Yazrin, AR Yazrin from Kuala Terengganu. Yeah, I asked you about the roof of the building just now. Okay. Uh, what okay. is your suggestion? I don't know. I I don't want to go on that on that matter because I think uh, that one maybe a coffee with you would be nice on the <laughs> of the building. Yeah, uh, yeah. Tapi so. cuma sekarang ni, okay. Uh, what we're doing here in Trangano, at least my firm, uh, we are actually specializing in Islamic uh de housing design. Uh, but uh, sometimes we do face some challenges from the local authority because uh, there are certain things in the UBBL that does not allow for a certain technicalities. Uh, contohnya here in Terengganu, we are only allowed uh, pagar for about 5 feet 
and some of the paga needs to have openings, etc., etc. So I have argued my ways with the local authority, but then uh, because it's the UBBL, so we have to follow lah. Uh, so what I'm trying to ask, is there a possibility from maybe UIA in uh, collaboration with PEM to actually include some clauses that can make way for design that complies with the Islamic Sharia uh, for future? Because we managed to have the UBBL uh, revised for the uh, uh, disabled person, yes? So I do not see why we cannot have a revision to cover this uh, subject. So maybe your to your topic was about the fence, eh? Are you talking one about the it, fence? Uh, one of it is the fence, lah. So then there are other issues as well. I mean, when we go on a bigger scale project like masjid and stuff like that, so there are some other technicalities as well, and some jurisdiction. Okay. So, yeah, we deal with Muslim uh, authorities here, but somehow it's really tough at times, not all at times, yeah. So, we, I mean, personally, we here at the firm looking forward for um, orang kata uh, some enlightenment in our uh, local authorities lah on this matter. Okay, Prof. Okay, okay, thank okay. I think none of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is one person from Rami Alaf Ala, Ala Fandi from uh, from uh, Germany. Eh? So glad to see you. Greeting from Berlin. Thank you. Yes, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah. Good salam. Do you have anything to say? Thank <laughs> uh, you, Prof. Uh, I'm Jamal. Uh, Jamal. Uh, FSPU. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, oh, Jamal. Jamal. Oh, Jamal, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, how are you? Uh, first uh, of all, uh, yeah. Jamal Laili, yes, yeah? I'm prof. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. First of all, on, on behalf of the faculty, we'd like to uh, thank you uh, for sharing your knowledge, uh, enormous knowledge and expertise uh, with all of us, uh, not just at UITM, but also around Malaysia and so around the world. Okay, so I'm uh, doing it uh, at home because I'm on MC, long MC, like 12 okay. weeks MC. Oh. Anyway, okay. Yeah, you take uh, care. Okay. okay. Uh, in addition, I have one question, Prof. Uh, okay. Prof, so, uh, related our township. Uh, township. Okay. I mean, yeah. Uh, Malaysia township. Uh, Putrajaya aside. Okay. Do you think that the new township that's been built in Malaysia, like uh, for the past like twenty years, you know, we have a lot of this new township in Puncha Alam, uh, as well as uh, no eco world, all of this uh, this township. Do you consider them like the newer one be more Islamic compared to the old township that we have? Okay. I like to get your comments on that. Okay. Um. Okay. Before that. I actually um I I I was in I I bought a house in Subajaya in 1989. Then in 2003 okay. I moved to I moved to Putrajaya. Actually for two years I wanted to buy a new property because uh, my late husband was a wheelchair user. So I need uh, mm -hmm. accessibility mobility uh, for him to go about to without my assistant. So I have to find a new place. So I visited many places. So at the end of the day, I bought a property in Precinct 8 in Putrajaya, where the location is very close to hospital, very close to Lake Club, very close to the waterfront, very very close to Medan Selera, very close to Pasar. So, um, so I just uh, talk about uh, Putrajaya. I've been to other places, tapi saya nak yang dekat dengan hospital. Lima minit sampai. So, uh, in Putrajaya Pusing uh, 8, the Medan Selera double story has a lift. And then the the Pasa is double story. So, he before he went up to the first floor to have his haircut because there is a big ramp going up. Although there is some, uh, 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 there is no landing. He has to wheel up to the first floor and very high building. But at least there is a ramp to go up. 
and he also can wheel from my house to the Lake Club. So, uh, so I need this accessibility so that uh, he can be independent. He's a civil engineer. So at the age of 40, he has to stop work because of disability. So I do not want him to have depression. So I moved from, from Subanjaya to where, where I live in Subanjaya was not accessible. There is no pedestrian walkway. So when I open my gate straight away to the road, so it is very dangerous for him. So I moved because of this element, pedestrian walkway, and the stars must be good, and uh, must the ramp must be good. Sometimes there is no ramp, there's a big drop. So I'm not able to carry him if there is a big drop. I had a bad experience where I have to, you know, I, I drive from UIA to Putrajaya, and when my husband wanted to go to uh, to toilet, so we stopped at one of the petrol station. There is a big drop, 150 mm. So I am very heavy. He's 70, so he did his business in the car until we reached Putrajaya. So, so that's why I'm, I try to champion this, uh, especially now a lot of aging population, because Malaysia is going to the age to age uh, uh, negara tua. So we have to start and improve our built environment. So uh, for me, uh, Prof Jamal, uh, what, what we is very important. The design of the unit also very important. Uh, uh, for your information, Perbadan Putrajaya, uh, in the housing project, they consider accessibility for some of the units, which I think is a is a good, uh, is a big congratulation to, to the officer there of their awareness to provide uh, facilities for the age group and the disabled. I think this is uh, timely, very, very timely. As well as children playground, I have done a lot of access on more than 600 buildings, uh, parks and so on throughout the country, throughout Malaysia. So there is one park in, in um, PJ, friendly to elderly, friendly to the which is which able exercise. The wheel and the park uh, has a lot of uh, ramp uh, at the, the Orabuta. Uh, there are some guiding block and warning block there. So that particular park is very good. And DPKL also uh, has done a very good job. A new uh, you know, public space uh, near the lake. And that building we have had uh, or since had, uh, had that, or, or access audit and it was a uh, good, good rating and accessible to uh, to the people, especially the disabled and uh, and the elderly pe people as well. So many people visited that place. So um, for a professional like a town planner, a landscape architect, yeah, those are doing big master planning and so on, they must consider this, not only writing, they must understand, they must attend courses, um, they must put this topic in their syllabus uh, at, the, at the university and so on. And sometimes the people design good buildings, a good environment, but they forget this group of people. And it is very difficult to upgrade the facilities at the latter stage with uh, with cost. You you robot and you bend your body, double um, double cost. Yeah, I hope I am answering your question. Okay, okay, yes, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Yes, Masi, sama. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I think yes, they have left an, another two questions in the chat room uh, okay. before we end up our session for today, since it's already 4 30. Yeah? So the second last question is come from Cik Farah Atika Binti Sha'ari regarding uh, I would like to ask your opinion on Islamic architecture that we took from Middle East and we apply in our country building without respecting the traditional architecture environment. Oh, okay. The Middle East, what sort of architecture? Is it the housing? Is it the shopping? Is it the form? What what sort of architecture? Is it the form? Is it the form? Respecting traditional architecture and environmental? Huh? Form and facade, bro. Form and uh, okay. facade. Form and facade. Oh, yeah, ini sebenarnya architecture ni macam fashion. Fashion ni. Fashion baju, macam buat baju kurung. Baju jubah, orang Arab. Baju kurung, orang Melayu. Baju kebaya, orang Melayu. But the user is the 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 user is the human being so the fashion is middle east 
Sama macam UIA lah. If you come to UIA in Gombak, you feel different architecture. Because the the form, the form, the roof is pitch roof. Because we have heavy rain, but the facade, they have uh, some sort of Middle East uh, reflection in the design. Eh? Ada juga tropical architecture, ada juga Middle East with arches and so on. So for me, uh, the most important thing, your building must function. Yeah? And the type of building also different. Let's say if you wanted to do traditional form, uh, traditional form, uh, for a smaller size of building is okay. But for bigger building like high rise and so on, you can apply the craft, uh, the carving, uh, the material, local material, but not not the architecture. Normally, the high rise, uh, the high rise building is a uh, is a uh, we use modern architecture, but the craft and so on we can use local. I hope I'm answering you, uh, sister. sister yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, we're gonna be uh, gonna be uh, the last question uh, is from uh, Nuru Shafinas. Uh, he's mentioned that he's your ex student from Kite. The question is, what do you think about the acceptance of non-Muslim regarding Islamic approach in built environment in Malaysia? Okay, uh, I share my experience when I was invited to give a talk in Singapore many years ago. So I presented my. Uh, the topic was toilet, public toilet from Islamic perspective. So the audience was, uh, majority was the architects from, Chinese architect from Singapore, and as well as the lecturers. So they were telling me, during uh, during Ramadan and Hajj, uh, in Changi Airport, they, they saw the Muslim men wearing apa ni, this Umrah attire, so they queue a long queue to the toilet, the male toilet. Although there are a lot of urinal in the toilet, but the male, the the male uh, Muslim, they do not use the urinal. So they were, uh, you know, they prefer to wait rather than using the urinal. So I explained to them, according to our uh, our prophet, we are not allowed to urine standing. Kita tak digalakkan apa tu kencing berdiri. So that's why they asked me that question. That's why they try to add more. Those information, they try to add more uh, at WC uh, instead of urinal in the in their uh, design. But uh, one thing uh, I, I like to add, now when I visited Singapore recently, I visited uh, Masjid Sultan, if I'm not mistaken. I like the ablution area. The ablution, everything is flat, including where the water falls into the drain, it is covered uh, the same level as the floor where you uh, stand to take your wudu. So it is good for both which are user, elderly and the public uh, as whole. So it is a very, very friendly uh, uh, place to do ablution. So I, I, I really appreciate that uh, sort of a design. There is one question uh, I saw just now. Uh, uh, it's from Sheila. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Prof. Is uh, interesting about um, you are mentioned about the university. In your opinion, how can the university play a role in this Islamic true on built environment and planning? Okay, uh, that is a very uh, good question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for your information, all the syllabus that we have in URA, so we have five departments we have architecture, URP, quantity surveyor. Apply arts and landscape architecture in our syllabus. We one of this, we inculcate the Islamic values in our teaching to our students. So the students also learn worldview, uh, Islamic build environment, worldview about Islamic built environment. They also learn Al Quran and Sunnah in their syllabus. So uh, that helps not only the student but uh, lecturers also have to do diploma and review knowledge. We have to go and attend this. What is Quran, what is Sunnah, and so on. So we have to learn. Or else we cannot speak about it because kita bukan ilmu bayu. Kita bukan ustazah. Kita kan arkitek kan. So we have to learn to understand and how to apply this into architecture. But actually, the most important thing is value. Tu. Termasuk hmm. ethics dan sebagainya. Nilai-nilai Islam tu yang penting sekali. Hmm. Banyak dalam Quran boleh rojok. 
banyak yes. sangat-sangat ya. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I think before we end up our session, uh, yeah. read out a few comments here. Uh, it is from Emilia Kalsum that he said that thank you for the experiences that you gave it. And it's a very interesting presentation. Uh, I hope that you remember uh, her that we have talking about the Sharia in architecture, especially settlements before our city Pontianak. She going to asylum a slightly different question as a principle of Islam. We already uh, realized that Islam has a lot of goodness uh, for the whole event, the universe, based on your experience. I think this should be a final question yeah, because it's already dragged at 20 minutes. So yeah. do we come? Yeah, true, to yeah. True, yeah. true. Actually, uh, we are following this. Rahmatallil Alamin. Because I didn't mention this. It is Rahmatallil Alamin. Kita gunakan konsep yang sama juga. Dalam uh, build environment and our uh, way of life. So the question it was, highlight, it was highlighted there, and it is true. We are following that as well. But uh, I didn't mention, I forgot, yes. Okay, so the question is, how do we convince the government, especially for the country that uh, are not Islamic country, to make it a, a standard or guideline accordance, uh, according to the Sharia and Sunnah? Oh, the mm -hmm. yeah, bagus, yeah? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll give you an example. Let's say I used to used to stay in Oxford before for four and a half years from a non-Muslim country. How the Muslim practice over there? So they have the opportunity to, to have a mosque. They also, uh, the Pakistani people are very strong uh, following the Islamic way of life and Islamic practice. I think all the good, there are a lot of good values in non-Islamic country. If you visit Japan, very clean and they use water in their toilet and so on. If you go to Spain, they have two WC, they have two WC, one B day, one WC. Very, very sad. I think there's, there's Spain, the Spanish people, they follow the Muslim previously. So that's why they have two toilet, B day and, uh, uh, and what else I've been to other countries uh, where they use water as well. Uh, Jap I think Japan is using it, but during COVID-19, that's why if they don't use water, they are rushing for the for the toilet roll. You can see people are rushing to the shopping complex to buy this during, uh, you know, MCO and so on. Uh, this is, uh, you know, something they can learn from the Muslim. You don't need the toilet uh, roll that much if you have water and so on. Okay. I think, uh, Alhamdulillah, finally we come to the end part of our third yeah. webinar series. Uh, I would like to summarize into a simple statement by saying that rigid to state that Sharia only aims or symbolize design project that lead to Islamic identity, especially the design of mosques, a Sharia compliance hotel or hospital, Islamic museum and so on. Uh, but this is, should be reflected towards uh, the quotations of Islam is a way of life. And I really love the quotation from uh, Ibn Abdun. Uh, this already mentioned uh, the previous webinar also by Dr. Dani, which is state that uh, as far as architecture is concerned, it is uh, the heaven where man's spirit, the soul, roh, roh, soul, and the body find refuge and shelter. It must be foretale and preserved. So, uh, therefore, Sharia integration in planning and design has a great potential, especially exploring towards built environment which uh, is referring to human by human and to be used for human activity so we would like to say um, thanks again to our speaker for sharing the informative and very interesting talk beside uh, to audience for your support and active cooperation um, it's just like we just have a uh, very um, uh, short time to continue it and before we end up today's webinar let's we close this series with surah al ans thank you very much yes uh till thank we meet you. again for the next uh, uh webinar session it should be another two weeks from now so inshallah Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Sana. Thank, thank you. you. Assalamualaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Asya. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof. Sama. Thank you, thank you, Mas Tura. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much. Prof, I think there's a lot of people here today from your connection, yeah? <laughs> yeah. From you yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you from my colleague from Pontiana and Indonesia, Riau, and yeah. also from from Bahrain. Oh, yes, we, we have a Bahrain just now. We have a from Germany, and also from from uh, Germany. Yeah, German, Berlin, Germany. And of your ex student, you can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes.